We had a blessed time last week celebrating 16 years as a, a local church here in Garrett County and, and throughout our region. And since we spent a little bit of time talking about where we've been and where we're going, I thought uh, that today and, and next Sunday might also be a good time to revisit the vision of Crossroads Church. Just, just revisit our vision a little bit. Like, you know, why are we here? And, and maybe you're new here and you're thinking, hey, if I make this my home church, where, where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish as a church? And, and I think those are great questions to ask. And I think those are great questions to kind of re-ask from time to time. And so, again, that's what we're going to do this week and next week is revisit the vision a little bit and take a closer look at four statements that really serve as guideposts for our journey here at Crossroads. And here are four statements we exist to be a place that people can experience God, find family, discover purpose, and transform lives. Why, why are we here? We're, we're here to experience God, find family, discover purpose, and transform lives. And today we're going to take a look at the first two statements. Next week we'll take a look at the last two. So let's talk about what it means to experience God. And to start us off, we'll go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the scriptural account of, of the birth of this thing, this movement that we're a part of, started 2,000 years ago, and we just simply found our place in God's plan 16 years ago. But let's look at the start of this thing that we call the church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Who, who's the they? We're talking about 120 of the followers of Jesus were gathered together in an upper room. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them Utterance. Again, this is the birth of this, this movement that we call the church. And I want you to notice the progression of events that happens here. Number one, the followers of Jesus are gathered together. And what are they doing? They are seeking God. Number two, the Holy Spirit then responded to their seeking. And as he's poured out, they have this experience. Everybody say experience. They're seeking God, he responds, and they have this experience where they are filled and overflowing with his presence. In fact, they are so moved that some people watching all this are watching them and they say, hey, these people, I, I, think, I think these folks must be drunk. It's kind of a bad thing for them to say about your church service, isn't it? But, but the Holy Spirit had come upon them and impacted them in such a way that the bystanders really didn't understand what was going on. And verse 13, it says, some mocked and said they're full of new wine. But verse 14, the apostle Peter here, he's one of the leaders. He stands up with the 11, the other apostles, and he raises his voice to them and says, men of Judea, Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Verse 16, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter says, what you're witnessing here today in the New Testament is actually a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy spoken by Joel. I want you to see what happens here on the opening day of the church. These Christians have an experience where the Holy Spirit is poured out, and then one of their leaders, Peter, takes them to the Scriptures. He says, here's what's happening right now. This is a fulfillment of the Word of God. And then Peter begins to quote the Scriptures, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And then verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So on this opening day of the church, there's this pattern established where we see a move of God's spirit and it is backed up or it is confirmed by the word of God. There are two things happening here. The spirit and the word are working together. So when we say 
at Crossroads that this is a place to experience God. Those are two of the elements that we're talking about. We believe that when we gather for worship, the Spirit of God and the written Word of God work together to impact our lives. One amen. Thank you, Norm, for coming today. <laughs> that, that's what we believe. When we're talking about experiencing God, it's about coming into a place, an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit is, is alive and He's present. He's here, and, and we combine the Spirit of God with the written Word of God, and the two of them come together to transform our lives. Now, over the past 26 years of working in churches, I have experienced many, many different types of churches. I have met some who believe that church should simply be an emotional experience. And if they aren't careful, these folks can get themselves into trouble by seeking or even attempting to manufacture experiences just for the sake of having an experience. And to be honest, some of these folks can get a bit uh, flaky. They can. And, and they, they, would, they would tell you that God tells them things that even violate his written word. I had a guy tell me one time that the Holy Spirit told him that he was, he was to leave his wife and pursue another man's wife. I said, bro, <laughs> you're being led, but you're not being led by the Holy Spirit of God. You're being led by your stinking flesh. That's a good place to say amen. amen. The Holy Spirit of God will never contradict the written word of God. And some churches come together and attempt to manufacture a move of the Holy Spirit. And when you try, when man takes his hands and tries to manipulate God into doing something, we always get ourselves in trouble. Somebody say amen. It gets flaky. Now, on the other hand, I've also met some Christians who deny the present working of the Holy Spirit. They love to study the Scriptures, but their relationship with God is only on an intellectual level. And if these folks aren't careful, they can get a bit uh, crusty. <laughs> I know I'm using some really, really deep theological terms. These are Greek words today, flaky and crusty. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, I've heard entire sermons. I've heard a man stand behind a pulpit with a Bible in his hand and preach for an hour, but it sounded like he was talking about a dead guy. It, it sounded like he was, you know, giving a lecture on, on George Washington, not Jesus Christ. <laughs> Crusty Christians who eliminate the present working of the Holy Spirit, they can get very judgmental. They can get very self-righteous. And at times they even use the Bible as a weapon against others. Both flaky and crusty are ditches. <laughs> Ditches that we try not to fall into here at Crossroads. We are fully committed to the Bible as being the inspired word of Almighty God. It is infallible. It is the authority for our church and our personal lives. Do we have anybody in the house this morning that has a great respect and gratitude for the written word of God? I, I do. I built, my, I built my life on it. However, at the same time, we believe that God is not just someone to know about, but he's actually someone we can know. So we believe that when we come together and seek him, whether that's through a song or prayer or the study of his word, the same Holy Spirit that moved upon 40 different authors to write the Bible, that same Holy Spirit is here. And he's present to take the word of God and apply it to our hearts so that we can then live transformed lives. When the Word of God and the Spirit of God work together in the church, then and only then can we experience the life of God. You know what God the Father did? God the Father took truth, Jesus Christ, and He wrapped Him in flesh and He sent Him to this earth so that we could experience Him. Please hear me. I'm, I'm not advocating for simply an emotional Christianity that has no theological foundation to it. Believe me, I've, I've been in churches where it's only built on emotion and they can get pretty weird pretty quickly. But what I'm saying is that we need both. We need good, solid, Bible-based theology that can stand the test of time, but we also need a right now, current, passionate, personal relationship with the living God. 
The psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's like he was saying, hey, try God on for yourself. Don't just know about him, but you can know him. And when the Spirit of God and the Word of God are both present, then the church becomes a place where transformation can happen. Somebody say, we need both. We need his Spirit and his Word here together working in us. And that's why it's so important that when you come to church... You personally engage in what's happening here. Okay, if you just come as a spectator, we ain't that good. All right, if you just come to watch, the show is not that good. I mean, I I appreciate, you know, the musicians we have and the singers and the tech people, but... We stumbled around here this morning. The show's just not good if you just came for a show. But if you came as a worshiper, (laughs) it changes everything. If you came into this place to have an encounter with the living God, then you're not going to be distracted when the wrong song starts. You're not going to be distracted when the microphone doesn't work. If you came to have an experience with the living God, you're not going to be distracted on whether it's raining or not or how long it's going to take you to get out of the parking lot or who's playing a game today. If you came looking to have an experience with the living God, then you set your heart to seek Him. You come in here and you lift up holy hands. You sit along you just don't listen you participate you engage and when we open up his word you say holy spirit i need to hear from heaven today i need to know that you're talking to me today you are not just someone else's good shepherd you're my good shepherd and god i've come to hear from you y'all y'all there's a there's a difference we can uh, we used to have a guy who came here and and uh I, I would see him, you couldn't help but see him, and, and he never engaged, he never worshipped, he never got involved, he, he was just a spectator, he's just looking around, and it never failed. Monday mornings, I get an email from him, complaining about something, and I would just want to say, bro, if you would worship Jesus, you wouldn't even notice all the things that you're complaining about. How is it that you can have two people... In the same church service, one of them, it's transformational. It changes their lives. God spoke to them. They know that they've been in the presence of God. A tear runs down their eye. I mean, it was, it was like they'll say, Pastor, today's service was just for me. God was talking to me today. You can have someone else sit in the same row and say, I didn't get nothing out of that. How, how, how? The difference is the heart. So I'm just saying, if if this is your church and you're part of this church that God's planted you here in this body, when you come to church, come with an expectation that you personally are going to experience God. All right. So we exist to be a place to experience God. Number two, we exist to be a place to find family. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. It says, now therefore you're no longer... In verse 19, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The New Century Version says it this way. Now you who are not Jewish are not foreigners or strangers any longer, but you are citizens together with God's holy people. Watch this now. You belong to God's family. You belong to God's family. So church is not just a place you attend. Church is a family you belong to. It's not just a place you attend. It is a family you belong to. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that being a part of a church family replaces your natural family. That's what cults teach. We don't teach that at all. We're thankful for our natural family. But we do recognize that through our shared faith, God will connect us to people that become our spiritual brothers and sisters And those relationships become vital in our lives. Can we just be real here this morning? Some of us came, well, let me rephrase that. All of us came from dysfunctional families. Some of us came from really dysfunctional families. Don't don't say amen, just, just, (laughs) just look at me, all right? 
Seriously, let's think about this. Some of us have never seen a healthy marriage. Ever. Everyone in our family has gotten divorced or they've got some serious issues, even if they're still together. And so we've never seen a healthy marriage modeled in front of us. But here we are following Jesus, and let's say you're married, and you're trying to have a healthy marriage, but yet you've, you've never seen one in your family. But one of the awesome things about the church of God is if you come in and you get plugged in and you start to meet people, you'll meet some couples who have weathered the storms of life. We can find some marriages that have made it through different or diff difficult times. And then some of us, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not younger anymore, but some of you younger couples can look to some of those older couples and say, you know what? I want to be like them. Rick and Sharon, how long have you been married? 52 years today. What? <laughs> Happy anniversary. I didn't know that, but the Holy Spirit knew that. 52 years. Listen, some of us rookies who are struggling and can't get along from day to day, we need to get a hold of Rick and Sharon and say, can we please come to your house for some lessons? <laughs> what you didn't have in your natural family, you can often find in the family of God. Some of the ladies here today, you may have never had a relationship with a godly woman in your family. You, you may not know what it means to honor the Lord with your life. If you're married, you may have never seen what love and respect and honor for a husband looks like. You've just never seen that modeled. But in the family of God, you can find some relationships with other women that can help mentor you and disciple you. Some of the men here today, you, you may have no idea what it means to be a man of God. And I don't say that with any disrespect. Please hear my heart. I'm not disrespecting anyone. I'm just saying sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we're just on autopilot. We're just on cruise control. And we're just taking life as it comes to us. And we have no idea that the Bible actually teaches us how to love our wives and how to raise our kids and, and how to honor God with our career and honor God with our finances. We're just, we're just letting life happen to us instead of living intentionally. And, and men, there are other men here in this church that can, that can help you with some of those things. There are men who have been walking with Jesus for a long time and we can look at their lives and not that we try to copy them, but as they follow Christ, we follow them. I'm thankful for mentors. I'm thankful for guys with gray hair and no hair. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Oh, I should move on. But while we're being honest, let's keep on being honest and say that most likely... Not, not always, I know there are exceptions, but oftentimes the only people in your life that will inspire you to walk with God are the people that you worship with. That's just true for a lot of our lives. That we, we, have, we have a lot of people in our families that are more comfortable with the old us than a born again us. We have a lot of people, our friends and people that we grew up with that, that our, our, our passion for Jesus makes them uncomfortable. And so they're, they're not going to encourage us to walk with God. Often the only people who are cheering us on and getting behind us and, you know, taking us by the arm or taking us by the hand and say, let's, let's, let's seek God together are the people in this room. Therefore, those relationships are vital. I, I shudder to think about where I would be without Jesus, but I also shudder to think about where I would be without the people of Jesus. Sometimes preachers will say, hey, if your life was a mess, you just need a relationship with Jesus. And I, I wholeheartedly believe and, and agree that we all need a relationship with Jesus, but that's not the only relationship we need. We also need a relationship with Jesus' people. Because they're the ones who are helping us walk this thing out. Christianity was never designed to be lived out in isolation. 
Yes, it's a personal faith, but it's designed to flourish when you're in community. Do you know that the phrase one another appears at least 50 times in the New Testament? Friends, we need each other. Some of us are one relationship away from a changed life. Oh, pastor, you're being dramatic. No, I'm not. I can't tell you how many times God has totally changed the course of my life by introducing me to a person. One of his people who they could see something I couldn't see. They had a little bit more faith than I had. They, they had a different perspective that I, than I had. And, and as they kind of, you know, helped to disciple me in the ways of the scriptures, all of a sudden my eyes are opened and, and the course of my life is changed. One person at a time. Some of us are one relationship away from a changed life. Amen. Now, just because God is our Father doesn't mean that this church family will be perfect. Right? Your, your church family will hurt you. They will. We will. I will. We just will. We're, we're redeemed people, but we're still people. <laughs> And that doesn't make us hypocrites. It just makes us human. And just as your natural family will require things like grace and mercy and forgiveness, so will your brothers and sisters in the Lord. But let me say this. These relationships are worth it. Can somebody say amen this morning? The people in this room mean so much to me. And I know there are hundreds of others who feel the same way. Now, as we mentioned last week, the church family here at Crossroads, we've been steadily growing for 16 years. We have become a, a large church, not by our design, not necessarily by our methods or, or our ideas. We've become a large church simply by the, the grace of God. But in order for a member of our church to be known here, you have to be engaged in a smaller group that we call life groups. I would love to know everybody. That's my heart. I would love to. Sometimes on Sunday morning, I will, I'll stand in my office, and I've got a window there, and I would just watch hundreds of people walk in these doors, and there are so many of you that I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I wish I could, but I, I'm just a guy. I'm limited, right? And, and, and I got a pretty good memory. I mean, I was knowing everybody's name up to four or 500 people, but I can't know 1,800 people. Nobody can. And so for, for the way for you to be known here at Crossroads, you've got to get into a life group because it's in those groups that we provide fellowship, discipleship, and care. Three elements. Fellowship, everybody needs that. Discipleship, got to dig deeper, want to grow. Everybody needs that. And then our, our pastoral care actually happens best in those smaller Groups And so we've been making some changes to the way that we're going to do groups here. And I just want to talk to you about that real quick. I mentioned it last week, but I'm going to mention it again. We're moving to uh, a sermon and semester-based model. Explain that to you. So a sermon-based model means uh, basically the discussion of the life group will be uh, centered around what we talk about here on Sunday morning. So it won't be something separate, something different. It'll just be a continuation of what we're teaching here on, on Sunday morning. So if you, if you were here, number one, if you were here, and number two, if you stayed awake, come on, you're, you're equipped then to participate in the life group, right? You're not going to get there and you, you don't have to do homework or read a separate book or anything like that. And hey, if you came to church or even if you listened online or on the radio, you're equipped then to participate in your life group. It's going to be based on the sermon. The second thing is it's going to be semester-based, which means it will have very clear start and end dates. I know all of our lives are extremely busy. So when you think about adding something, you know, into your regular calendar, and this is something I've got to do every week from now till Jesus comes back or every other week, it just becomes a lot. And, and we, we understand that. And so we're moving here to a semester base. We'll do semesters throughout the year. But this first one, starting the first week of October, will be six weeks, okay? We'll finish up before Thanksgiving. That semester will be over. We've got 
groups meeting all over the county and outside of the county. We've got groups for couples. We've got groups for singles. We've got a young adult group we're really excited about. You know, a lot of times what happens in church is, is kids are plugged into the youth group, but when they turn 18, where do they go? What do they do? No offense, mom and dad, but they might not want to come to your group. Right? They want to, might want to get around somebody their own age, but they hit that, that 18 and we kick them out of youth group. We don't do that here, but that's what happens often. They, they just feel like, I don't fit there anymore, but I don't really fit in big church or adult church. How, where, where do I plug in? Well, we've got a young adult group going to meet here at the church, ages 18 to 25. We'd love to have you get, uh, get into that group if, you, you know, if you're in that age category. So... Again, if you've not signed up, some of the groups have filled up already, but we've still got openings. I encourage you, go to crossroadsofthechurch.com today, find a group that meets your need and get signed up because we want to see you have that fellowship. We want to see you have that discipleship growing in your faith, and we want to care about you. And the only way we can do that is in a smaller group setting. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Church is a family we belong to. It's a family we grow with. It's also a family we build with. Look at verse 19. It says, Now therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So this is, this is a new family. Verse 20, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. When you and I are fit together, we grow. Say that again. When you and I are fit together, we grow. If that's true, and it is, we can conclude the opposite is also true. If we don't fit together, we don't grow. We're not designed to grow in isolation. God does things in us and through us in community that he cannot and will not do alone. And all the introverts just groan. <laughs> Don't tell me that. Can I just tell you introverts, because I'm one of them, we introverts. God is bigger than our personality. And sometimes he calls us out of our comfort zone so that we can be connected with the people that he's called us to do life with. Verse 22, in whom you are also being built together. Everybody say built together. For a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So church is a family to belong to. It's a family to grow with. It's also a family to build with. It's true that God has a purpose for every individual in here. That is true. But God also, if this is your church, God also has a collective mission for us to participate in, everyone to participate in. I just want you to think about that for a moment. If God has called you to this place, and I believe God calls to specific churches, then we have a collective mission. There are some things that God has called us to do together that we cannot do alone. That's why it's important that every member fully engages. God has given you gifts and talents, but they aren't simply for you. Do you know that? That everything that God gives us, he intends for the benefits of others. Norm, if God has given you gifts, and he has, it's not for you. It's for you to take those gifts and to serve other people. And so I invite you, if this is your church and you're not serving in some way, serve. Get plugged in. Go to the website. Look under our, our serve team. We're looking for about 50 more volunteers right now. I told you, in the past six months, 375 people have served in one of our services. That's a lot of servants, isn't it? Praise God for that. But it's not enough. We need more. We're looking for 50 more to fill all the slots and the holes that we have for ministry here. And so, again, if this is your home church, if God has called you here and you're not serving, we welcome you. We need you. Come, bring the gifts and the talents that God has given you and get plugged in somewhere. I think about this building, and, and we have never, we've never made church about a building. Never. And, and we've proven that, that church is the people, right? It's not the building. And we've proven that by meeting in a movie theater. At times we met in the fire hall. We've met at Wisp Ski Resort. When, when they wouldn't let us meet during lockdowns, we met in the parking lot. We met at the fairgrounds. Uh, I mean, 
The church has never been about a building, but we know practically as our, as our church family's grown, we, we needed a building. And, you know, we built this place together. There was no one person. It was too big. It was too expensive. We couldn't build this. There was no one person that said, oh, I can just step in and, and I can build that. But when God gave us that call four or five years ago and we began to pray and work together and, and I was sharing the vision of what God had called us to do to build a spiritual home for Garrett County, there were hundreds and hundreds of people who contributed to build this thing together. Y'all, again, it's just an example but what I'm saying is there are things that God has called us to do in this community that I can't do alone, you can't do alone. We are the family of God. We have a collective call, and God wants each of us to just simply say yes to him. I'm going to ask you to stand today, and I'm going to ask my wife to come and close us in prayer. But again, we're just taking two weeks here, and we're kind of revisiting this, this vision, these four statements that serve as our as our guidepost and first one we talked about was experiencing God and I just really want to encourage all of our church family doesn't matter what your personality is I know some of us are more outgoing some of us are more you know emotional all that sort of stuff God's bigger than our personality and I'm just encouraging each of us when we come to church when we gather Let's come with an expectant heart that we are going to experience God for ourselves. We're not going to watch someone else experience God. We're not here to watch a show. We're here to worship. He's worthy. Has he been good to anybody? He's worthy. We're here to worship. And then the other thing we talked about today was finding family. I made that statement. Some of us are one relationship away from a changed life. I know there are people in this room, you're lonely. You're hurting. You're trying to carry some weights and some burdens by yourself and you can't do it. I can't do it. We need each other. And if you're not engaged and, and, and you're not building some really high quality relationships here, I, I'm just challenging you. Get into a group. Begin to pray. If you're, if you're a lady... <laughs> Say, Lord, I, I need a mentor. If you're, if you're, I'm, uh, ladies, you have lady mentors. Men, you have men mentors. <laughs> Make that clear. If you're a brother and, and you need a spiritual brother, you need someone a little further ahead of you, you need a spiritual grandpa, you need a spiritual dad, just begin to pray and say, say God, I, I need some other men in my life that will help stir up my affections for Jesus, I believe God will give them to you. How do we come pray with us today? God, we come to you today and we say that we need you today. Not just yesterday, not just what happened to us when we were kids and when we gave our heart to Jesus when we were little. But God, we need you for this day, for today. We need you for tomorrow. We thank you for what you did in the past, but we're also looking forward to the future. And we say, God, we need you every step of the way. We need you to t walk with us along the path, to hold our hand, to show us where to step, what steps to take. We need you, Lord, to ordain our path, just like it says in Proverbs. God, the steps of the righteous are ordered by you. So, Lord, we ask you to order our steps, to meet us where we are, to let us have that, that personal relationship with you when we open up the word of God, that it becomes real to us, that it speaks to us for the situations that we're going through, that our family is going through. God, we ask you to take us to scriptures that will encourage us and help us along that journey. And God, we thank you for the family, the family that we have here at this church. God, I thank you for my family, that we have found cousins and, and uncles and brothers and sisters, that we've found grandparents and mamas. Father, whatever it is that we have 
felt like we were lacking, you have supplied it. So God, I ask you to do the same for each person that is here today. Whether they're listening on the radio or they're online or they're here in this, in this sanctuary today. God, I ask you to place them in your family, surround them with that family unit that when they need a mama Eunice, they've got one. When they need someone to hold their hand, when they're crying, when their son is going through whatever it might be, when their daughter's going through a trauma, whenever their, their loved ones are going through cancer, whatever it is, God, you have given us a family to walk with us. No sickness, no cancer can be taken on alone. The loss of loved ones can't happen alone. We need a family to walk with us every step of the journey. So God, I ask you to help us. Help us to sign up for those life groups this week and, and to be placed in the right one. Lead us and direct us. Father, if, if we need a mentor, God, I ask you to connect those mentors with the mentees, God, that they would know exactly who they need to be hooked up with that can help them on their journey, that they wouldn't walk alone in this journey of life. Now, Lord, I ask you to be with us as we go about our week. Continue to lead us and guide us and keep us all safe until we come back next week. In Jesus' name, amen.